Hello, my friend. Well, good to see you. Good to see you, Craig. Last time I saw you, we had fun. Yeah, we did. I really like that background. Do you? This is mm -hmm. the Bay Area. And if you look closely, it says middle of nowhere, and that's where I live. Where's that? Point to it. Right here. Right here. It says, it says right next to my ear, it says haystack. Yeah. And then above that, it says middle of nowhere. I see it. And that's my town. Is that Oakland? Very close to Oakland. You can throw a rock to Oakland from okay. my house. Yes. Okay, nice. All right. So we're going to just dive right in. Craig, you, you're the data guy. I don't know if you know about this, but I used to run Compu Tennis in 1989. <laughs> so, Good for so, you. I, no, I go back with data for quite some time, so I'm really excited about everything you do. So I think the first thing I want to get into here is, where are we? What's the state of the evolution of data-driven coaching? Well, in order to answer where we're at and where we're going, we're just going to need to know where we came from. So yes. official analytics first started in 1991. 1991 to 2002, primitive, like seven line items. First serve percentage, first serve points one, second serve points one. Unforced errors, double faults, aces. It's about it. Uh, so that went to 2002. 2002 to 2015 was kind of played around with it. You know, got a little better. But really since 2015, last five years, it's taken off, you know, we've, we've put a spotlight on it. We've understood um, how important it is. I mean, you know, we want to organize our practice court. We want to understand why players win and lose. You know, it's, uh, it was certainly some work that I did, but there's a lot of other people in tennis that are also doing an outstanding job as well. You know, we got some more access to Hawkeye, even though it's not enough. Um, it's not everything that they've got. But, the, you know, the problem in our sport is you've got ATP, WTA, ITF. For the ATP, collecting it as Infosys. For the WTA, collecting it as SAP. For the ITF, collecting it as IBM. Then Hawkeye have got their own little side gig. And, you know, the Tennis Australia have got their gig, their own side, you know, side dish over there. Um, and no one wants to share anything with anybody else. And it's, it's very, very difficult. So... You know, we're, we're making steps. It's getting better. Um, you know, the discussion that the tour is having at the moment that should WTA and ATP merge together. Um, you know, I don't know why we're not talking, you know, just right off the bat ITF, just one governing body. And then one governing body looking at the analytics of our sport. You know, I can go even at a slam. I can, I can find data that's, delivered to maybe on court versus delivered to a journalist versus delivered to a player versus delivered in a PDF. And it's all different. It's all different layers and different things that are going on. So extremely fractured sport, even worse when we look at the data side, um, but we're improving, but we are improving and it's getting better. So um, right now, I think we're at a stage where it's time to look at new things. You know, and I'll give you an example. Um, you know, we can have a metric at the moment that says, you know, Novak plays Roger and Roger hits 24 end winners for the match. So it's like, whoa, 24 end winners, you know, we've, we've got some good data. But, you know, if we just slice it simply by, was Roger serving at the start of the point or was Roger returning at the start of the point? And compare it there, just put a, just put a line down the middle. Here's all the data when you served, here's all the data when you return. It's amazing. It's like two different sports, where, you know, everything that follows. So what we would find there that 15 winners happened when Roger was serving. Mm. And then it's like, okay, well, out of those 15, is there a common rally length? And, you know, 11 of the 15 are going to be a three-shot rally where Roger served, the ball came back, Roger either hit a winner or Roger hit a ball that Novak couldn't get back. So, you, you know, the 20 draws down to 11 are identical. And a lot of times, whether you're serving or returning, and then if it's a first or second serve versus a first or second serve return, 
Um, you know, there's, there's several of these things that we've never really considered, but, you know, I'm looking at a lot of data now. So, okay, were you serving when it happened? Were you returning when it happened? And, um, and, and it just provides a different light and we find a, a bigger sweet spot for the data rather than just 24 and winners. Yeah, that's awesome. And you know, when I'm doing on-court coaching with my players, I like to ask them this, what's the most common way you're winning the point? And what's the most common way they're winning the point? And then how, what's the most common way you lose the point? And how do they lose? And then we, what we do is we, we can usually latch on to one thing that we can play on there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Completely agree. You know, it's tennis is a game of repeatable patterns. There's going to be subtleties to what we're doing and, and layers to what we're doing and nuances. And, you know, if I'm serving at level in the juice court versus 30 love at level, I'm going to be more inclined to really make that first serve, to play a high percentage point, to look for the forehand. But at 30 love, I'm much more inclined to go to a secondary pattern. I'm much more inclined to maybe even do something like a serve and volley or a drop shot or, you know, throw them something that's a little different so that they aren't seeing the exact same thing every time. And um, you confuse them, you know, you confuse your opponents as to what you're doing. So doing things by point score is also a really big deal as well. So the number one thing I'm hearing there is that the ability to get more detailed about things has gotten better. That you, yeah. can, split, you can split these things out. You can tag the points. Yeah. So um, the way I've been doing it is uh, with, you know, teaming up with Warren Pretorius um, at Tennis Analytics. And Warren's kind of had his business and a great friend. And, and his business is servicing the college teams. And they would send him data and he would give it back. And I was kind of doing my own thing. I'm like, Warren, you know, this is so labor intensive for me. Can I hire your company to do all of my tagging? You know, the work I was doing for three years with Novak um, and, and, and whether it's other juniors or other players. So we created all of the things that I look for, you know, very heavy on the first four shots, cutting the baseline up into A, B, C, D, cutting the service boxes up into one through eight. So, creating a tagging panel from that, producing a match intelligence report that gives us all of that data. And, um, you know, we're, we're just looking at things differently. You know, if you looked at one of these match intelligence reports, it looks almost nothing like a typical analytics uh, report from a, a professional match. We just go in different directions because we focus on what matters most to winning. And, where the serve location is, is a really big deal. Um, a, B, C, D, you know, where you break opponents down is a really big deal. So, you know, Warren and I are, are doing a lot of work in that area. And um, yeah, it's gonna get better. I mean, you know, we're nowhere near the end of this road, <clears throat> excuse me, or at a place where you say, okay, you know, we're 98% there, there's, you know, we're. We're just going to fill the rest in. I, I don't even know whether we're 50% there. I think there's yeah, so yeah. much learning and growth coming in the next few years. Okay, that's awesome. So a lot of people haven't had a chance to see you lately. Um, so why don't we get into this thing about errors, you know, and, and you know, a little recap on why, why unforced errors and forced errors are a – I don't even know the word for it. What word would you put on that? An unmitigated five alarm fire. <laughs> Structural collapse. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. Well, he, and you, you, know, know, you, you were at, Wait, you, I have, wait, I got to throw one more thing in there. And the firemen don't even want to go inside. No. 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 All right. Okay. So, so here's the classic example. <laughs> you were at PTR, right? You're in the room when I did the the 12 points yes okay so let's just recap those uh, this this little project so um i'm going to speak at ptr i'm talking about you know winners and errors and unforced errors and all, and all this stuff so i pull up I, I go and look at I, I just pull up a match i've got nadal versus melman us open and I, I i extract 12 points and i have from that match i have the official match report and in that, it says 
it was either, it ended either as a winner, an unforced error, or as a forced error. One of the three. So I, I play the point. I, I go to the presentation. We got, you know, I don't know, a couple of hundred pros, t- tennis coaches. I mean, tennis experts in the room. And I show them a point. I'm like, well, I've, I already know the official, so I don't show them this yet. But I'm like, t- you got to stand up. I had everybody stand up in the room, 200 people standing up. And then you've got to vote. Was this a forced error or was it an unforced error? And I play the first one. You, they had to turn around and commit their answer so they couldn't change it, talk to the person next to you. And after one point, half the room's sitting. Half the room got it wrong. Um, uh, and so we watched the next one. And then after two points, there was, I think, six people standing. And then there was only one, one guy left after three points. So out of 200 people, 200 coaches that must know this. They must know this. I think it went a little longer than that. It took, yeah, a, it took a little bit longer than maybe that. Maybe one more. Yeah. We, we got th- out of the 12, we got three rounds in. But then I went to the <laughs> USPTA um, uh, symposium in, here in Texas, the USPTA Texas division. And they were all done in two. All done. Out. Goodbye. Yeah. Gone. So we, we had, I think, four rounds at PTR. Maybe we had five or six rounds. All right. Okay. Got it. Got it. And so the problem is the subjectivity of how to, how to understand them, right? It's not only subjective for the fan. We, if anyone must know the answer to this, it's us, it's you, it's me, it's experts in this field. And we don't have a clue when we look at this, whether it was false or unforced, we don't have an idea. So the real simple answer is, it's a winner, it's an error. That's it. If it touches the racket, it's an error. If it doesn't touch the racket, it's a winner. Clean, simple, we can understand it. It's all good. It's all good. We do not benefit one iota from labeling something that we believe is an unforced error. Doesn't make my coaching better. When I work, again, when I work with Novak or Berrettini or Straff, Popperin, I'm never talking to these guys about unforced errors, ever. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Okay. So, so, but when we're teaching tennis, we're, there's got to be some kind of dividing line between um, risk reward ratio. Okay. You go for a little bit more, and there's a little bit more of a chance of an error. So that's an acceptable error. And then, yeah, well, and then there error. are. Then there are errors of execution, errors of bad sh- shot selection, errors of, um, you know, whatever. I mean, something that's completely in the control of the person, right? They, they you know, ought okay. not to be making that error. But let's say you and I go to the practice court. Yeah. And I feed you the ball and you hit it to me and I hit it back. You know, we're trying, we're doing our level best to keep that ball going. We're making errors all the time. I'm trying to hit it right where you like it. I hit, and I go, oh, I like that shot. And you dump it in the net. It happens. And then in a match, when I'm actually not trying to hit it in the zone, and you make an error and you think you shouldn't miss it, you know, I make a move this way, and you, you see it out of the corner of your eye. A ball, you know, the wind brings the ball in and spacing gets back. I don't, I, I don't anticipate this faster shot. Right. Errors happen for a hundred different reasons. There is no reason or point or value or benefit in creating a hundred different criteria of errors. They all happen. They happen. They happen. That's it. Okay. Okay. That's it. No. But okay. No, I I like your point. But I mean, okay. As as people go up levels, it becomes a game of how to win a few more points every match. Like. Like one of my one of my favorite okay. things was, but why not one of my favorite? It's the Corrego same for the beginners. Go ahead. What? It's the same. You know, I don't think you can make that statement and say as you get better, it's only the the elite players that will benefit for one or two more points. It's the same for the kids. Everybody, everybody. Yeah. No, I I think it was you who shared this thing about uh, Federer won fifty three percent of his points one year, and then the next year he won fifty four percent of his points and then doubled his prize money and, yeah. and won three times as many tournaments yeah. by yeah. winning 1% more points. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, okay. 
let's so let's do this. Let's get into uh, best practices for noobs because because this whole thing can be overwhelming when you you know when you get the fire hose information from Craig and now you got to go home and you have to use it and all you have all you have is your little squirt gun. Where <laughs> where should people start? with their squirt gun to dispense the data or collect it or whatever. Um, are you specifically talking about what, what they should focus on in matches or? Yeah, like, okay, what, let's, let's say. How I'm they a, organize their practice court. Let's say I'm an associate instructor and I'm 27 years old and I'm coaching JV high school tennis. Where do, where do I start with stats? Um, understand that if you want your JV high school team to win more matches, yeah. you are absolutely going to, well, the first thing that you should do is go, go back home, get a sheet of paper. And, and, you know, there's six boys playing in their singles and you've got six other boys sitting and watching and you give these kids a piece of paper and you write down a rally length of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight to 15. And you tell them, when the rally ends, and again, rally length is predicated by the ball landing in the court, which is another, you know, shocking thing in tennis that, you know, we, the heading is shots, three shot rally, but it has nothing to do with the shot, has nothing to do with the ball hitting the racket, has to do with the ball hitting the court. Again, we get no information that tells us that. But if I served you, you return to me, I hit a winner, three. I served you, you return to me, I make an error, two. So I understand that. Yeah. Um, but the first thing that these coaches need to do is, okay, maybe I, you know, I went to the symposium, I, I learned all this data from Craig, but let me see the reality of the kids that I'm coaching. So just go out there and have a couple of columns and say, okay, if the rally was three shots or two shots or five shots, a five shot rally, put a click in five and put a, put a little notch in one and one, two, three, four, five and slash it in eight shot rallies. And then just look at it and you're going to find that one shot rallies, which is the serve went in and didn't come back, is going to be the most dominant. Then you're going to see that zero through four rallies in zero being a double fault. One, two, three, four is going to be in a range of 60 to 70, 75% of all points. Then you're going to look at your practice court and go, huh, all we do is rally. All I want from these kids is to hit a billion balls cross court. We, we throw in a few serves at the end. Um, we don't do any return work. And the reality of these kids' matches doesn't even look like what's happening on the practice court. So you let them, you know, so you've got to juggle these two areas. Match court, practice court. Which is the leader? Historically, it's been the practice court leads, and then you just hope you win a matches. Now it's let the data from the match court lead, and let's go back and reorganize our practice court. So Yeah, we, well... But conventional wisdom for a long time has been that the serve and the return are the most two important shots in tennis. People know that, right? But the problem is they don't practice like that. Just like everybody knows um, the mental game is so important, and then they spend 1% of their time teaching the mental game. It, the, 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 here's, the, here's the dilemma that we have. Yeah. If you play tennis socially, you and I say, let's, you know, let's, let's go play. Let's go play. Let's go hit some balls. You're going to go and stand on one baseline. I'm going to stand on the other baseline. We're going to rally with each other. The baseline is the home of social tennis. It feels good. We're playing the sport. It's where we should be. I'll hit a few volleys. You hit a few volleys. You know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll shank a couple up at the net. And then if we want to play points, we'll hit a few serves returns. But socially... The baseline, the baseline's king because it doesn't really, you're not playing points. You're not playing points. But when you go to play a point, it was, when you go to play a competitive point in a match, the key is you don't start out of the hand. You don't start with rallying. You start with the serve and the return and the serve plus one and the return plus one. So you've got to make the distinction somewhere that says, what we're doing on the practice court does are we just trying to have fun do we just want enjoyment which is great which is fine there's nothing wrong with that or do we want to win matches do we want to win mm -hmm. then 
you know, and another study I did is that you know, the, the match winner wins the zero through four rally length over 90% of the time. The match winner wins nine plus about 55% of the time. Match winners win the short rallies. What happens for these players is the first two times they touch a ball matters way more than anything else. But the first two touches are not feeding out of the hand and then a rally ball and a rally ball and a rally ball. In a match, yeah. a okay. serve... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to dig into that a little bit. Okay, I want to dig into that a little bit because this really applies, I think, to lots of players, but high school coaches and maybe even college coaches will benefit from this because the longer a point goes, the more of an emotional investment there goes into it, especially as the pain of lactic acid is starting to build up, you know, 20 shots in and whatnot. So, so then, you know, somebody loses this 20-shot rally and they just feel crushed because they gave so much, so much to it, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so maybe that happens to my player, right? And then what happens is the guy who's serving because he's still gassed double faults on the next point. And I go, yep, that one counts the same, right? Yeah, so the, the thing is that we can give... Or, or players can, they can give too much importance to losing a 20 shot rally. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and again, it's just perception. I can lose a 20 shot rally and, and, and just say, I just lost one point. It's okay. We're not going to play a lot of those. It's okay. And I can let it not affect my psyche. But at the same time, I can lose that 20 points, 20 shot rally. I was like, wow, they're more consistent. Wow, well, I've got to, you know, the pressure ramps up on me. It's the same, you know. You know, it, it's like, when do you really feel confident you're going to win the match? And a lot of times, it's if I can find a, a part of the court that I can attack this, uh, my opponent repeatedly, where's, do I have a honey hole over there? Do I have something that I can just keep hammering away? And if I can find that, whether it's a forehand return, whether it's a longer rally, whether it's bringing them in, whether it's me approaching the net, any of those factors, if I've got that, idea that I can, I, I've got a go-to strategy. I know a well, I got a well. Um, and if the well's long rally is fine. It doesn't matter really where the well is, but just because you lost a long rally doesn't mean you're going to lose the match. Yeah. Well, I think um, mentally, if, if you're mentally ready for the fact that you might lose a long rally and then, and then the next point could be short and you win and it's all equal, then you're sort of inoculated against being crushed by it. But if you're winning that lengthy rally and the other person's not inoculated against that, then you really have a chance to sort of crush them. Yeah. So <laughs> I mean, yeah. I've seen a lot of matches fall apart because somebody lost a long rally. Yeah. They, they let it get into their head. If you yeah. just understand the metrics of a match, you know, it, it, I, I mean, it would make sense if you say, let's say, oh, and you lost a 20 shot rally. And you go, wow, we're going to play a ton of 20 shot rallies. There's probably going to be 80% of this set is going to be 20 shot rallies. And I lost the first one. I, I, you know, I'm a little fearful for the rest of the set. Okay, I get that. But the 80% for the rest of the match is going to be one shot rallies, not 20 shot rallies. Right. Okay. So, so one thing I think is really interesting, I get in these conversations with college coaches. And we talk about the data and then, then, you know, there, there's a little bit of a bias there. And so then they collect their data and they come up with 55% of the points were in one to four. And my thought is that college players are grinding from the serve forward that they're not thinking about, you know, a shot combination of my, I'm going to hit my first serve here and try to hit another shot there and yep. crack the point open. You know, they're, they're, they're hitting a kick serve into the center of the court and they're ready to hit top spin forehands. Yeah. Period. I, what do you I, think yeah, of that? I, I like, yeah, no, I like it. There's, there's two parts to that. One is um, you're exactly right where it's get the serve in and just, it, it's, it's a one shot rally and then it's a 10 shot rally because it's just, I serve in and now it's grind, 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 grind. You know, the five through eight is patterns. It's I go here, I go the two-one pattern. I go C, D, A. Deep to the backhand, wide to the backhand, wide to the forehand. 
So there could be less of that. That's one explanation. That's a possibility. Um, the other one is at 55%, it's still a massive number. It's not like <laughs> you drop from 70. It's not like you drop from 70 to 40. I mean, you, that means you've got 45% for everything else, which will probably be 30% in, in 5 through 8 and 15% in 9 plus. So, yeah. you know, we don't normally see when, when, you, when you get drained from 70% to 55%, so it's 15 percentage points, they don't drain from 0 to 4 and insert, the, insert immediately down into 9 plus. The majority go into 5 through 8, and then what's left over goes into 9 plus. So yeah. you, but the, the thing is, just ask the question, what's number one? And what, it's, still, it, it's still probably, you know, even at 55%, it still could be double what's next. Double. I mean, I've seen Novak play matches where it's 55%. It's fine. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with playing only 55% of zero through four. In fact, a lot of times you say that's a good thing because we're reducing our errors in zero through four. Nothing mm. wrong with it. That's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Yeah, I, but I yeah, it it, it, it's only I, to me. It's only bad if you're playing mindlessly to get there. Yeah, because okay. you know, and you know, because okay, like there was a. You remember the remember when Tip Sarovich took Spetter to five, followed by Joker beating him in five. Okay, USA. Okay. I think it was the open, and and. The tactic was to hit 110 mile an hour, 115 mile an hour flat serve out to the very corner of the backhand, right? To Federer, because then he'd be stretched way out and off the court. Yeah. You know, and then you've got a, just a big, juicy, big, wide open court on the other side, right? So yeah. that tactic, you know, you know they, both, they both executed that very well. And that was that sort of exposed that, but that's that to me is one of the prototypical awesome things is you find a vulnerability of where you can serve to and put your opponent immediately in in a bad position, yeah. and then you then your next shots you know you, you you'd have to be brain dead not to hit it deep to the opposite corner or even hit a short angle on the other side. Yeah, I hear. You. Okay, so. Now, here's an old stat, and I'm not sure how much this holds up, but, you know, tell me what you think. Um, that 70% of errors go in the net. Don't know that. Okay. Um, that's a good one. That's a good one. I'm gonna, while we're here, writing myself a note. Okay. Because... I, would, I would love to know that because this is something I've, I've been teaching is, is – I mean, the first job, our first job is to get the ball up and over the net. Yes? Yeah. So, Bill, 70% of all, is that, are you including the serve in that or not? I don't, I don't know. I don't know what so the original have, context of the yeah. assertion was. Yeah. With, with serve and without. I think it would be interesting to go with serve and without serve. I would think that a lot that people net their serve way more than they ought to. Yeah. yeah. All yeah. right. There's, so there's five errors you can make. Yeah. In the net, too far, too far long, too far left, too far right, and then you just whiff it. You mm -hmm. just go to hit it. And <laughs> I whiff it. Right. You know? So beginners whiff a little bit. Um, yeah. We tend to not whiff a lot, but. It happens, but you know, you've got a rectangle of a court, so you know, there's forward, back, left, right. That I do know the number one um, double fault, which is only second serves now. The number one double fault is in the net. Mm, okay, for the, for the women, it's, uh, I, I did a study at the US Open for the women, it was 50% right at it, for the men, it was 46%. So, wow. if you're working on second serves, the number one thing you want to do is get it out of the net first. Yeah, this was one thing a coach worked with me on is that in, instead of worrying about anything with my second serve, to always say deep to the backhand. So then, uh, you know, if I'm going to miss, I'm going to miss long. And it's yeah. harder to miss long because gravity is then your friend. Yeah. So, okay. Any, it, it seems like we should probably wrap up here in a moment, right? But 
what are what are some of the subtle things, or what are some of the, what are some of the subtle, subtle things that the average tennis pro can talk to their people about to help them win more matches? Stuff that doesn't really meet the eye. Yeah, um, I would say when when I'm doing the match intelligence reports, and this comes from a lot of years of just studying why players lose, get broken, why they lose serve. And, you know, a real common theme, because I'm looking at this every time I study a match, I look at this stat, is that did you win the first point of the game? Did you go 15, love, or love 15? And it's overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, the players get broken because they go love 15. So it's only one point. It's only one point. And you are still actually at love 15, you know, let's say on the pro level, they're still at, you know, let's say they're going to win 85% of their service games. And at love 15, that drops, but it's still, we're still way the favorite. We'll still win two out of three. But you don't, we hold a lot of service games. We don't tend to drop a lot. But the, the common thing with getting broken, which is losing matches, is in the service game you got broken, there's probably a double fault. There's probably a double fault. And you probably went love 15. Got it. So, so is it 60% of games are won by first person who wins the first point? More, way more. Well, a player's going to hold 80, you know, a player's go. Actually, the women, the women at, the, at a U.S. Open will hold like 66%. The men are holding like 80. Mm-hmm. So if you go 15 love, you're up around almost 90%. Wow. One of the first things that you want to do on the first point of the game is get your first serve in. You're not going for an ace. You're not really, you know, especially the first couple of service games. You're going to go body. You're going to expect it to come back and you're going to look for a forehand. And that's how you want to start the love all points. First serve in and a forehand. Start it that way. Don't go ace. Don't go second serve. Just that little dynamic, getting ahead. We play a sport of getting ahead. Love fit, and think of it like this, 15 love, it just, it sets the weather for the rest of your service game. It's 15 love, the sun comes out, it's 82 <laughs> degrees, there's a three mile an hour breeze, it's just, it's fantastic. Love 15, the temperature just dropped, the wind just rose. Yeah. You know, for riding now, I'm serving in the ad court and... You know, for a lefty, it's a little easy because we like the slider out wide. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. You just signed up for a bad vacation. Yeah, you just signed yeah. up for a bad vacation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, one of the things that I would do is really have that set play is it's love all, first serve and a forehand. First serve and a forehand. And typically, first serve, forehand to the backhand. Typically. And as you gain more confidence at love all, you may go for more corners. You know, if you've got a, playing an opponent that is donating a free point every three or four points. Yeah. Your risk tolerance can, you know, you can, excuse me, take on more risk. You know, a couple of things that I think can help with this is if, is if people played one point tournaments, cause then you really got to take care of that first point or it's over. Yeah. Or, well, or yeah. Or, or the other thing I like to do is have kids play best two out of three points, because if you can get best two out of three, you'll be the first one that gets the 30. Yeah. Um, I like both of those. Another variation is you simply make the first point worth two. Mm. It's <laughs> good, good right there. <laughs> you, how long have you been in Texas? That's, uh, that's, that's, that's start- southern Louisiana right there. You know what? Uh, let's um, go. You, yeah, let's wait go a minute. Play level. Yeah. And then, and then play that point, yeah. but then stay on the same side because it's either going to be 30 love or love 30. So stay on the same side. Don't get all confused by playing point score wrong. But oh, go right. and play a set and play the first point worth double. All right. Are you ready to wrap this thing up? Yeah. I'm, I, yeah, I got, I got such a yeah. – I, 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 th- these days, I don't know how you feel, but these days at home – they fly for me. They go so fast that, you know, I'm working on my website and I'm doing, you know, I'm, I'm doing one of these a day, sometimes two. I've got to say, I can't do it to a lot of people. I Push appreciate your time. My pleasure. My pleasure. But, um, you know, working on my website, you know, when you, I, I think the big thing is you're creating, you're creating blog posts, you're, you're researching. 
and that takes time. I'm writing ATP stories. So these days, you know, it gets to four in the afternoon. I'm like, what in the world happened? Like, <laughs> when you, so often I'll go to, you know, I'll go somewhere for three days and it, it, it's so weird. I'm there, you're there two days and you go, you, you say it every time. It feels like I've been here a week. It feels like I've been here a week. You go somewhere, time slows down. You stay home, time speeds up. So I, I'm constantly, I get up at farm, I get up at 5.45 every morning to get ahead. And well, and you know, you can, you can try what I do. If you miss your flight, you get an extra day. <laughs> I remember that. I remember that. So, yeah. all right. So let's bring it home. Give me like uh, one or two or three things to bring it home. Just, just the little take homes for today. Well, you know what? I think, um, again, these will come from kind of random spots. The, obviously, the, the pandemic is brutal and horrific and, and, and just terrible for, you know, people and families and especially elderly people and the fear of what it's bringing. Um, we've always got to try and be positive. We've always got to try and be productive. So, I, you know, just one thing I want to throw out there is use this time. You're never going to get something like this again where you're home for weeks on end, maybe months on end, and be as productive and learn something, learn a new language, learn something new with tennis. You know, do, do, do something that takes a month to do and, and be, you know, be productive. We put off stuff all the time. So look at the pandemic and say, you know, what, what, what's, what, what can I turn into a positive out of this? And for me, you know, I, my website is something that I've done and I've taken care of, but now I'm all, you know, I'm eight or 10 hours a day. I'm on it and, and putting stuff out there and going through it and improving it. And, and it's, it's going great. I launched a new course with Jeff Greenwald called Getting Tight, all about the linking the mental and emotional. So, you know, it's really helped. I mean, you can, you can kind of surrender to this time, but, you know, I would say, Take control, be the boss, and, and learn something new and come out of it with a brand new skill, with a brand new skill. There's awesome. More. Should we stop there or you got two more? We want to win more tennis matches. So um, yes. here's, here's the next one is, think okay. of this. The first two times you touch a ball matter more than anything else that happens later in the rally. The first two touches matter more. Put more emphasis on your first. Take more care. You know, if people say the first four shots and first strike, you're trying to survive the first four shots. You're trying to make sure that the first serve return goes in. You're trying to make sure that serve plus one ball after a second serve that's at your feet goes in. So that's the, uh, lot, the second thing. And lastly, get to the net. Work on your net game. Work on approach and volley. Work on your volley technique. You know, the net's an amazing place to be. Don't just go out there and, and, and um, you know, just rally and hit balls in the back of the court. So, um, you know, I, I was doing a Zoom call yesterday with a, with a student. We went through the, one of my courses called Short Ball Hunter. And, you know, I hadn't been in it for a few months. And I'm like, man, there's so much good stuff in here that just it gives you, you know, the, all, all of the facts, all of the evidence that the net's a great place to be. Okay, awesome. Tell us how people can get connected to you and your website. BrainGameTennis.com. There are 10 courses. There's singles, there's doubles, and there's the mental side. If you are brand new and you're like, okay, I'd like to do better um, in, in here, but I, I'm kind of new to it, absolutely start with the 25 Golden Rules, a single strategy, and the 25 Golden Rules, a double strategy, if that's your jam as well. For until June 15th, everything is discounted 20%. Um, if you're more, um, you, you know, more serious and you, you're deeper into tennis, you know, if the first four shots has a lot of the data we've talked about. Game plan has junior to pro metrics and the mental side, you know, definitely is the new course getting tight. So braingamtennis.com, that is where you can get all of that information. And if you run into Craig in person, make sure you get him some tequila that goes down like butter. But it's got to be good tequila. No, good that tequila. stuff was like butter, man. Yeah, and we sip it. We're not in college doing shots. Tequila's not for shots. It's, that's ridiculous. Tequila is to savor and enjoy. And, um, you know, just give some good stuff and just 
sip it sometimes on a, with a little bit of ice, sometimes not. Um, make sure you're over 21 and, and <laughs> sip it. And uh, it, it's, 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 yeah, it, it's a good deal. It's a good deal. It's been a pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much for your time. No, thank you. Thank you. Anytime for you. Anytime for you. See you Cheers. soon. Goodbye. Okay, All right. All right. Bye-bye.